You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stray off my notes just for a minute. If you uh, take your Bible, turn to uh, 1 Peter and just kind of plant yourself there. But you may want to kind of keep track with me because uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a couple things at you real fast and then I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm, I liked what I studied for tonight. I, I enjoyed uh, putting it together. And to me, it's just a joy to go through the Bible. I don't care, I don't care if you read the Bible a hundred times in, in lifetime. It'll be joyful for you to read it the hundred and first time. You'll get happy about it, all right? So first, Peter, and just kind of mark yourself there. But a uh, couple things that I want to give you, very, that's something the Lord has given me in the past all few days or so. I've been talking here in first Peter about a fiery trial. And we know that in life, in general, there are times when the fire hits us. We know there are times when we go through rough times and rough patches in life and so on. My, my theory, my opinion of things that are going to happen in the last days, we were talking, boy, you, everybody online, you, there should be a camera and microphone in my office. We were talking about conspiracy theories and world events and Bible prophecy in there. And I mean, there was just all kinds of stuff that was just rolling out. And, um, but anyway, my idea of how things are going to happen in the last days, I believe, involve a fiery trial for God's people. And then we're taken home. Okay? Now, I know that that doesn't fit on a chart that I've seen, okay? Doesn't necessarily fit in somebody's book, all right? But it, it is what I see in the Word of God. Now, concerning that fiery trial, if you take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, I think that God is preparing... Let's just make an assumption, okay? Let's assume that practically everybody... In this room tonight, everybody watching online, let's say that we're the crowd that sees Jesus appear in the air. Boy, wouldn't that be exciting? Amen? Now, I'll tell you, the only thing more exciting about us being alive when the Lord appears in the air is you getting to be dead and going first. Amen? So that would be exciting. Okay? Uh, but anyway, uh, let's, let's just say that all, all of us here are, okay? It, it could be a, a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. It, it could be any number of those things. I personally think that there are some things that are not quite lined up yet. But that's just, I mean, and you know how God works. Sometimes he can just line everything up in about two minutes, okay? So that doesn't mean anything. But anyway, I think that God may very well be training us just like he's got an army and he's training his soldiers for a certain... How many of you were in the army or in the military? You got trained before they sent you out with a gun. They told you what direction to shoot it in. Amen. Okay. And they trained you a little bit before they, before they shipped you out there. Well... I just kind of see us, we are, we are the soldiers of the Lord, and we're supposed to put on armor and be ready to fight. So Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I've preached on Ephesians 6, I don't know how many times I've preached on it, and I'm never done with it. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You may have fought some of those this week. Okay? Then he said, now watch this. Now wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now that's part of this little package I'm giving you. This little package of a fiery trial culminates in an evil day. Very. And listen, when God says something's evil, it's 
bad, evil. And God is going to require of us to stand in that day and not fall away. I don't know about you, but I've asked God many, many times, God, don't let me. Don't let me fall away. God, you hold on to me real tight. Don't let anybody pluck me out of your hand. Okay? But anyway, to may be able to stand withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now watch this, verse 16. Remember the fiery trial? Where's that fiery trial? How, how is that going to work? I mean, what's going to happen? Look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the what? Fiery darts of the wicked. Now, I used to change that verse in my mind, and I have no idea why I would do that. But in my mind, I was thinking that it was Satan launching the fiery darts. Now, he may be part of that, but it does not restrict the fiery darts to simply Lucifer himself. It says the fiery darts of the wicked. Did you know that that would include everybody and every evil thing that is wicked? Amen? And the darts that are being hurled are fiery darts. Darts that are related to... Just in the last, I mean the last couple weeks, as I'm reading my Bible in my own study, I am paying more attention now to fire in the Bible than I ever did before. Because I think that literally this earth is, hell is coming to this earth. So where do you get that at? Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the fifth seal. That... That pale horse that comes out has death and what's following with him. And if you say Wyatt Earp, I'm going to shoot you dead. Okay? What follows with him? Hell. Hell. And what is hell? Hell's on fire. And if you look at the judge, if you look at the trumpets, they're all related to fire. You look at these darts, what kind of darts are they? And what are we going to need to be able to defend ourselves against them? You're going to need to say, I believe every word that's in this book. I believe what it says. I don't argue with God. I believe what it says. Amen? Okay. So that's just one thing I want to throw at you. Second thing I want to throw at you is in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Fiery trial, which is to try us. Fiery darts coming at us. A fire devours before them. A flame is behind them. That's that Joel's army in Joel chapter 2. In the days when the bridegroom's going to come out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet when the trumpet sounds. And all those things I think are packaged together. We always have pictures in the Bible, right? Okay? Name two people in the Bible that were raptured. Enoch and Elijah. Here's the story of Elijah. It just, I mean, it just occurred to me how, how Elijah was raptured, how he was translated. I want you to look at, let's pick it up in verse 9 of 2 Kings chapter 2. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. There's, here we have the, the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because at the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you had the sons and daughters prophesying, but you did not have blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And the sun was not darkened and the moon did not turn to blood and the stars didn't fall on that day. So that is an unfulfilled prophecy. It has a perfect last day's fulfillment. So it's a double portion. Right now, the Jews have a single portion, which is the, Holy, which is the Old Testament. 
The double portion is what God promised them in Jeremiah 31, a new covenant. Isn't that neat? They're going to, listen, that new covenant is for them. Amen? Okay, we're just kind of like hitched on. Okay, but it's for that God intended it to be for them. So that's the double portion of the Spirit. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. So now look at verse 11. Look at this. Look at what came down from heaven before Elijah was translated. What was it, Sasha? Chariot of fire and horses of fire. And that's what separated Elijah from Elisha. And then Elijah was taken into heaven by that whirlwind. But what was it? A chariot of what? Fire. Fire comes before the translation. That's what I think. Okay? So you just take that now and you just, you put it in your mind, put it in your heart. You go to the Lord and say, God, I want to know the truth. I, don't, I want to know what Mike Hoggard says. I don't want to know. I want to know what the Word of God says. God, you show me what the Word of God says. Is that fair enough? Amen? Amen. First Peter chapter 1. Turn back there. Come on, hurry up. What are you waiting on? 20 minutes till 8. You guys are going to be hollering to get out and get late and get home and watch movies or something like that. Binge watch some show for 18 hours. Okay? Man, I'm having a hard time on weekends anymore. Because you know I like to watch these cop shows. Well, it's fine when they only run 30 minutes. But now there's live PD. And it's a three-hour show. And I'm like up till 1 o'clock in the morning seeing who else they're going to arrest. All right? So anyway, maybe I ought to quit that and go to reading my Bible more. Hey! First Peter chapter 1 verse 9. He said, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And I like this part right here. Of which salvation? The prophets have inquired and searched diligently. I think when you read the Bible, you ought to do it on purpose. Amen. I think you ought to, if you've got a question, you ought to search for it diligently. You ought to inquire of God. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. See, if you get it from YouTube or if you get it from some guy, it, it, it probably won't go in right. But if you get it from the Holy Ghost, it'll stick there with you. Amen. It'll last in you. It'll be good in you. So anyway, inquire diligently. Search diligently. Watch this now. Who prophesied of what? The grace. They did not prophesy. Listen. God's grace and His mercy and His salvation of salvation by grace through faith is not limited to the New Testament. It is everywhere in the Old Testament. And I've gotten into arguments with people who, I won't even get into the ism that they are of, but they say, oh no, they were all saved in the Old Testament with law keeping, and I'm going, that's nuts. I know of one person who kept the law. Amen. They said they prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them. Now, don't you think about that. Here is, somebody give me the name of an Old Testament prophet. Anybody. Jeremiah. Did you know that, there, that Jeremiah, the way he wrote his prophecy... If you analyze it, you'll see that its tone is different than, let's say, Joel or Isaiah or Amos or Malachi. It's to his tone is different. His writing style is different. Um, the, the things that he prophesies, the way that he talks, what he speaks of, it's different than what Isaiah wrote down. And that leads these intellectual scholars to say, well, maybe, probably Jeremiah didn't write this. When I was in Bible college, I heard everything, including, well, it says Jeremiah, but Jeremiah may not have written this. And you've got scholars out there that no matter what the Bible book is called, that guy didn't write it. Somebody else must have wrote it. I think that's nuts, amen. It says Jeremiah, Jeremiah wrote it. But anyway, Jeremiah had the Spirit of Christ in him, 
And what you're seeing is that in every prophet, even though they are different, you are seeing a different aspect and a different nature of the same Jesus Christ. See, Jesus wasn't there bodily like he was in the four Gospels. But he was there, all right. He was there in Jeremiah. Give me another one. Huh? Samuel. Jesus was in Samuel. When Samuel prophesied, it was Jesus coming out of his mouth. Think about that. He's there in the Old Testament. But see, at that point, he looked and sounded like Samuel. Later on, he looked like, here's another one, David was a prophet. Prophet of God. He's in your Bible. Holy men of God. Speaking every moved by the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. So anyway, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Did you know that you have a knowledge that angels don't even know? Angels desire to look into these things and they can't figure it out. And you might think, well, that's, I don't know, that's kind of weird. Angels are like they're higher above us. Yet God gave them a unique nature about them. And there's some things they just can. Wait, what is it we know? Trace, what is it we know about deer? What is it that deer cannot see? The color orange. And my dad put orange on me and I'm going, Dad, they're going to see me. I mean, look at this thing. sticks out like the sun. A deer can't see the color orange. Where did you hear that from? Trust me, son. Okay. So he made me wear orange. But they can't see it. There's things about angels that they just can't understand. And yet God bypassed them with that knowledge. And he gave it to us sinners. Whew. What's good? Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. So what we're going to do, we're going to go in the Old Testament just very quickly, I don't know if I can get all this done by 8 o'clock, but I want to give it my best shot. We're going to look at men in the Old Testament who had the Spirit of Christ in them that something about them foretold the sufferings of Christ or the grace of God. Let's first look at Adam. The Bible says in Genesis 3.21, And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now the question is, what was it that Adam and Eve did in order to deserve God covering their nakedness. What was it that they did? Not a thing. That's what grace is. You see, God looked upon them. Alicia, why don't you come turn the air down? There's a little stuffy in here to me, isn't it? Anybody else? All right. All the cold people come sit over all huddled together. And all the hot people scatter out. We're going to turn the air down a little bit. All right. But anyway, Adam and Eve did nothing to merit God covering them. God looked upon them. They tried to cover themselves with aprons. That was insufficient. And God knew it. And God himself had to cover them. Galatians 3.27 For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's what that was a picture of. Uh, something had to be slain and the sinners had to be covered. Somebody say amen. Revelation 3.18. Jesus looks at the Laodicean church who thinks that they are rich and well off. And he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine, cells, thine eyes with eyes have that thou mayest see. Jesus has a covering for us sinners that only he can provide. In fact, there's another one in here. In uh, Revelation chapter 19. The Bible says uh, concerning the bride of Christ, it says in uh, Revelation 19, 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Who said amen? Ah. That's not what the King James says. NIV says that. The NIV 
puts the righteous deeds of the saints as the white linen, fine and clean. And it's teaching that if you do good works, that's nuts. Amen? Amen. You can't listen. I don't, I don't want to get into that. We're just not going to preach out of NIV here anytime soon. Amen? So that's Adam. That was the grace of God in Adam, manifested in the Old Testament. Noah, and while I'm doing this, maybe you can think of an Old Testament character where the grace of God was manifested, where they, in their deeds or their actions or the story about them, manifested the grace of Almighty God. We have Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What was it that Noah did in order to merit the grace? Some would say, well, he built the ark. and that No, the grace came before building the ark. In fact, the grace came before God ever told Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth, but I'm going to save you. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a manifestation of the grace that you and I are the recipients of. Amen? Who's got somebody in mind? Anybody? Huh? Naaman. There you go. Didn't think about him. Tell me about the story of Naaman. Leprosy is a type of... Sin, it's uncleanness. And by the way, it's stuff rotten off of you. It's rotten, it stinks, it's bad, okay? So what happened with Naaman? I wanted to get cured. Right? Mm hmm Yeah. First, he wanted to pay for it. He had a brand new set of clothes and he had all this and that and the other. All the, you know what us preachers like, right? Big thing of fried chicken. And, but he was going to pay for it. He was going to pay for the preacher's services. And Elisha wouldn't take it. Didn't even come out to him. Told him to go dip in the River Jordan seven times. He turned around and got mad. He said, well, ain't that, that, have you ever seen the River Jordan? It looks like Joachim. I would not pick... The Jordan River to go swimming in. Okay? But that's what he told him to do. And when he finally did it, washed him clean, white as snow, came out like baby skin. What was his works? Nada. He was willing to pay for it, and the man of God wouldn't take it. It's by grace through faith. Because he finally just decided, well, why not? What else have I got to lose? Maybe that was you when you finally yielded to Christ. You're going, you know what, why not? God took the why not, amen? I like that. All right, the next one on my list is Abram. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be Blessed, what was it that Abram did? Not a thing. If you, re if you read Genesis 10, Genesis 11, and then Genesis 12, you'll see Abram mentioned in there. But that's about it. And then all of a sudden, God just gives a message to Abram and says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make your name great. And from you, Abram, every Family and nation in the earth is going to receive a blessing. From Abram came Jesus Christ. God chose Abram and his line to bring forth Jesus Christ. What did Abram do to deserve that? Not a thing. The Bible, God gave that to him before. before Genesis 15, the Bible says he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So we see here that God's grace extended to Abram through faith because he believed the Lord. So what God did then was he took every sin of Abram out 
And he replaced it with righteousness. For what reason? He believed God. But you see, in Genesis 15, the context of that is, God is reiterating to Abram, I'm going to give you this land, I'm going to do this for you. And Abram believed God. He believed that God was going to do this thing. He believed that God was going to give him a seed, because as of Genesis 15, he's not had a child yet. But he believes God, and God gives him righteousness because he believes it. That is the manifestation of the grace that you and I now receive. Amen? But then we have a guy named Abraham. Same guy, different name. Genesis 22. Now we look and see, and the angel of the Lord called, him, uh, called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. See, what I like about that is, is when Isaac inquired, Father, here is the wood. Where is the sacrifice? King James Bible says it better than any Bible in the world. My son, God will provide himself a lamb. And he provided himself. Amen. And you go, listen, go to Blue Letter Bible and check the other translations on that verse. You'll be sadly disappointed at what they say and how they say it. The King James says it better than any one of them. God will provide himself a lamb. So he looks... Um, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. See, Abraham was prophesying of Calvary. By the way, they were in the exact same place. And you want to see time prophecy here in Genesis 22? The Bible says that it was two days and on the third day... He lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Precisely 2,000 years from this event was Christ on that same mountain being offered, offering himself as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin. This Bible's good. Amen. Jacob. Who's got one besides this? Who's got another one? Manifested grace through an Old Testament character. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Alicia. Come on, out with it. Hosea. Gomer. Gomer was the whore, the harlot. She was Israel. And God said, go marry her. And Hosea, even though he was commanded by God to do it, finds himself falling in love with her. So he falls in love with a harlot and he marries her thinking that he's going to change her life by marrying her. Next thing you know, there's kids now born and they don't look like Hosea. Next thing you know, Gomer's not around anymore. Gomer's been out, same thing she has been doing. Even though she's got a husband that love her and kids that want her at home. Some things are just not easy to walk away from. Can I let God's people say amen to that? So he sends the kids out looking for her. They find her. She's being sold. as a slave. And even though Hosea already owns her, he pays the price. And he buys her back again. And this time now, she's Mrs. Hosea. She's different. So that's Israel. That's what's going to happen. Okay? That's God's grace. What is it that Gomer did to deserve her husband? Not a thing. But you just can't explain love you can't explain why you love someone you just love them 
And when you really love them, you do anything in the world for them, even if they don't deserve it. There's a lot of Gomer in us and a lot of Hosea in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, that's good. That's better than what I had. Jacob. Jacob, Genesis 28. Uh, I'm going to run through this very quickly. Jacob here, he uh, sets the pillar up there. God gives him a dream of the ladder ascending up. The angels of God ascending and descending on it. That's the Son of Man. The angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In verse 16 of Genesis 28, Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. What did he call it, by the way? Bethel. Well, that's what this place is named. Linda, you remember back years ago, the pastor wanted to change the church name? You remember that? There's a lot of water under the bridge. He wanted to change it to some something, fellowship, agape, something, I don't know. And even I was, I'm going, you know what? This place is Bethel. And I'd like to keep it Bethel. This is the house of God. And this is the gate to heaven. Amen? And what did Bethel deserve? What did we do to deserve it? Not a thing, guys. Not a thing. Joseph, look at Genesis chapter 50. Joseph, this, is, this is Joseph's brethren. Joseph's brethren took Joseph when he was 17 years old, tied him up and was going to kill him. Instead, they threw him down a pit where there was no water and they were going to leave him. And then they ended up selling him into slavery. Joseph went from being a slave, to being a servant in Potiphar's house, to being accused of rape, then put in prison for something he didn't even do, and ends up rotting in prison, and he prophesies to the baker and the butler, and he's saying, when you get let out, tell Pharaoh about me, and tell, tell him that I'm innocent, and let me out of here, and they don't do it. And so he still has to rot in prison until they figure out he's the only guy who can tell the dream so he gets out, and now we're two years into the famine, and he's standing there looking like Zephnath Paamiah, not Joseph, and he's speaking Egyptian, and his brothers are standing right in front of him. What could he have done to his brothers? Had them slain. But look at what he did. Verse 15, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. And they did unto, For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept, and they spake unto him, you ever get a thought that when you confess that your Savior weeps? Not in disappointment. Why was Joseph weeping? He's weeping out of joy that his brothers are willing to confess their sin. Don't you ever forget that. The devil's going to tell you, oh, you can't, you can't repent of this. God's too mad at you. You've done done it. That's, God hates your guts. Catholic Church tell you that Jesus hates your guts and Mary's going to try to intercede for you to get time off in purgatory. That's not how it is. You've got a picture right here of what Jesus does when you confess. Weeps. Joy. Joseph wept, and they spake unto him, and his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Look at you. Here's your Savior, and he says unto you, Fear not. 
For I am in the place for am I in the place of God, but as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto, unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So Joseph here is Jesus. Israel, his brothers are Israel, who have done nothing but try to have their brother killed, sold into slavery, and now they have the gall to stand before him begging for bread. What does true love do? True love gives it to them. What does the Bible say? Love your enemies. And he had, he had 11 enemies standing right in front of him. And he chose to forgive them, weeping over it. Understanding that though they, when they hung him on the cross, they meant it to him for evil. But God meant it for their salvation. We did nothing, people, to deserve God's grace. And never will. Okay? Never will. And yet he gives it to us. And man, I've got Moses here. I've got Joshua here. Huh? Esther. Esther. I've got Samson. What does Samson do to deserve? Here's Samson. Here's, here's the spirit of Christ in Samson saying, let me die with the Philistines. He's going to kill his enemies in his death. That's Christ. Okay? And I've got David here over Goliath. I've got Isaiah here writing Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report. I've got Jeremiah here, the prophecy of lamentations. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is full of reproach. See, here's the spirit of Christ writing of the sufferings of Christ in lamentations. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. E Ezekiel is the son of man. That's what Jesus, how Jesus referred to himself as. You have Jonah, who is in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. I mean, you have Jesus literally in every place in your Old Testament. Testifying of the grace that is to be brought to every one of us here. And who deserves it? Not I and not you. So he gives it to us because he loved us. And when we try to explain why we love somebody, we can't do it. We just say, I love them. And when we try to understand why God loves us, we'll never understand it. It's just that God loves us sinners. And he's picking a bride for his son who deserves the very best. Amen? Let's give him that. Out of our lives, let's give God the best bride for his son that he deserves. Amen? Stand to your feet. Who's, who's got, who got another one? Who, who came up with another one? Anybody? Or are you just ready to go home? It's been a hot day, hadn't it? Even, even me, I had to turn the air conditioner up a little bit upstairs in the balcony. Just to... Yeah, I got a little stuffy there for a little bit. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus, for manifesting yourself in Adam. It was the wound in Adam's side that God made the bride out of. That was you on the cross. It was Moses, his face shining like the sun. It was Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, crying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's Ezekiel, the son of man, to whom you gave the word to where you promised that when you came you would do it by the book. Lord, you were manifested in every place. You're the rock that followed Moses. You're the lamb that was slain. You're the high priest that slew the lamb. 
It was your blood, which was the blood of atonement. And yet you were the tables of stone that that blood sprinkled to sanctify. Jesus, there is no end to the depths of how you can be manifested in the Old Testament. You're so there and it's so obvious, but Lord, we understand that you have revealed to us the mystery. Something that you kept hidden from all the people, including your own. And even your own people, Israel, Lord, they don't see it. They don't understand it. Lord, you picked little pea brains like us. And you manifested a mystery. The, the greatest mystery of all time of who your son, Jesus Christ, is. Who the Messiah is. What he's, what he's going to do. What he did do. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for loving us and giving us grace, God, that we did not deserve the day we got saved. And, Lord, the truth of it is we haven't deserved it since then. And I suspect, Lord, that we're not going to deserve it from this day forward. So, Lord, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you, God, for having mercy on us. We thank you, God, for forgiving us. Help us, dear God, to be the very, very best that we can be for your Son, Jesus Christ, because He deserves it. Thank you, God, for filling our minds with knowledge. Father, give us understanding based on that knowledge, and Lord, give us wisdom throughout this week. We're going to need it. Lord, bless your people and bless your word. I thank you, Lord, for this time tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said... Amen. God bless you tonight. You're dismissed.